Our next speaker, our first speaker this afternoon, is Rupert Darwal. Uh, Mr. Darwal is a graduate of Cambridge University where he studied economics and history. He worked as an investment banker before becoming a special advisor to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He is currently a consulting director for the White House Writers Group and a fellow at the Center for Policy Studies. He has written extensively on both sides of the Atlantic, including for the Wall Street Journal, National Review, Forbes, The Financial Times, The Daily Telegraph, and The Spectator. And he is the author most recently of the book, The Age of Global Warming, A History. And I'm happy to say, and I think the author would agree, that it's not a book Al Gore is going to endorse anytime, <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, the title of his presentation, presentation today is Environmental Scares Yesterday and Today. Please welcome Rupert Darwal. Well, it's, uh, it's a very high honor for me to, uh, to be here with you. And I have to say, after the, the sheer quality of the speeches, uh, the uh, speakers you've had uh, yesterday, I am, I am Ali Hersey, who I have an immense admiration for. I mean, what, a, what a, an amazing hero. And then this morning, um, Ben Shapiro's extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, talk. And Larry Arn on the, on the Nobel uh, calling to teach, and also the questions that have come from the floor and the interactions I've had with you, and I, I just come away thinking, only in America can you get this. <laughs> and and, and what, what, what's been, what, what people have been talking about, I think, in all, all, the, all the presentations have, have been about defending the values which underpin Western civilization. And these are values that are not only worth fighting for, they are values that must be fought for by all of us. I've been asked to talk to you about environmentalism and the politics of recurring environmental scares. Of course, the biggest and most recent one being global warming. And there's a philosophical connection which links the poison of political correctness and the disease of multiculturalism and the rise of environmentalism. Environmentalism is an ideology that represents a regression from the standards set by the scientific revolution at the end of, towards the end of the 17th century and a repudiation of the values of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. They reject tolerance and the search for objectivity through criticism and disagreement. It is no accident that the United States is unique in having had a debate on global warming, not just on what should be done about it, but more importantly, public disagreement about the science behind it. Even so, fatwas have been pronounced by the climate clerisy against the so-called climate deniers. Scientists and a United States senator have called for anti-mafia racketeering laws to be used against fossil fuel companies. We cannot take the co continuance of freedom of thought and speech for granted. Nonetheless, America's political culture, ultimately the American Constitution, which is, I believe, the single most important product of the Age of Enlightenment, ensured debate, discussion, and dissension. And it's why Hillsdale's mission and values and principles are so vital. Universities used to be the repository of Enlightenment values, but those values are now dead or dying in the academy and the First Amendment openly scorned. I will come to some of the factors behind that in the context of global warming and the rise of environmentalism, but at the outset would like to mention one in particular, the corruption of the academy by federal research funding. In his farewell address, President Eisenhower spoke of his dismay at the extent of government funding of scientific research. A government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity, Eisenhower warned. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Eisenhower identified a scientific technological elite who saw themselves as purveyors of miracle cures capturing government policy. And he cautioned against the recurrent temptation of believing that some, quote, 
spectacular and costly action might offer a miraculous solution to all current difficulties. Thanks to environmentalism, in our day, the miraculous cures have been inverted. That danger can be seen very clearly in global warming. Now scientists discover eco-catastrophes and they preach planetary apocalypses. A key tenet of environmentalism is the pre-eminent role of science, that science should be mobilised to save the planet, science as global therapeutics. This, in turn, gives rise to another regressive feature of global warming. Because climate science became the leading branch of global therapeutics, it made climate science too big to fail. In becoming a tool of political advocacy, the nature of climate science became antithetical to the nature of science itself. What is called objectivity consists solely in the critical approach the philosopher Karl Popper wrote. Because criticism risked undermining the consensus needed to save the planet, evidence was with withheld and criticism delegitimized as serving the interests of malign fossil fuel corporations and malevolent climate deniers. Climate science is paying a steep price for its political preeminence. And perhaps the most important idea I'd like to get, a, get across uh, this afternoon is that environmental, environmentalism is an ideology in just the same way as Marxism is and can be analysed as such. But whereas Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels themselves wrote the canonical text of Marxism, with environmentalism there is no foundational text from which the ideology sprang fully formed, as it were. Rather, environmentalism is a confluence of ideas into one big idea, which today has reached its highest form in the idea of global warming. Environmentalism borrowed the concept of alienation from Marxism, this time the rich man's alienation from the means that made him rich, or in the case of Prince Charles, those that made, that made others rich. Marxism was about changing class relations with the means of production, of expropriating the bourgeoisie so the proletariat can enjoy the full fruits of its labour. By contrast, environmental, environmentalism requires a change in the means of production themselves, a far more radical proposition, requiring a rollback of the Industrial Revolution. And it's here that there's a big divergence between the old left, Marxist and non-Marxist, and environmentalism. On the one hand, Marx and Engels saw capitalism and industrialization as welcome and historically inevitable stages on the road to communism. They were therefore anti-environmentalists. Uh, anti Marx and Engels utterly rejected the notion of capitalist economies being constrained by a fixed resource endowment and by static technology. Quote, we start from the premise that the same forces which have created modern bourgeois society would also suffice to raise the productive powers of each individual so much he can pre produce enough for the consumption of two, three, four, five or six individuals. Environmentalists, on the other hand, believe that modern industrial, industrial civilization has sundered humanity's umbilical cord with nature in a process that threatens our survival as a species and the planet's future too many people consuming finite resources, upsetting fragile ecological balances. Alarm about population growth was first popularized by Thomas Malthus at the beginning of the 19th century, a century in which Britain's population nearly quadrupled and life expectancy began its long-term increase. Despite the total failure of Malthus's prediction that population growth would be repeatedly checked by famine, disease, and war, for true believers, the idea that there are, or that there will be, too many humans on the face of the planet is an article of faith. However, Malthus's ideas on human population were a major uh, factor, major influence on Charles Darwin. So in this regard, it's perhaps re worth recalling what Friedrich Engels wrote in the 1860s, because it has, it has a big carryover to environmentalists today. Nothing discredits modern bourgeois development so much as the fact that it has not yet succeeded in getting beyond the economic forms of the animal world. To this day, think Paul Ehrlich in his bestseller The Population Bomb, bio biologists are among the leading anti-population preachers. By the middle decades of the 20th century, 
as Ben Shapiro, um, and we had a question on the, from the floor, uh, we talked about the, the Frankfurt School. And Marxists had to work out why the bourgeois, why the working class and advanced capitalist societies showed no inclination at all to revolution. The, the Frankfurt School, who, as Ben said, they came from, they came from, they fled Nazi Germany and settled in uh, in, in America for a short time, for 20 years, some of them, uh, merged Marx with Freud to develop a cultural explanation. But doing so led to a break between the old left and the new left. Intellectuals such as Her Herbert Marcuse castigated American blue-collar workers as accomplices in the emergence of fascism in late-stage capitalist society. Quote, violation of the earth is a vital aspect of the counter-revolution, Marcuse told a 1972 conference on ecology and revolution. He yoked together protests against the Vietnam War with environmentalism. The genocidal war against people is also ecocide. Their training in Marxist dialectics enabled the Frankfurt School to fur furnish progressives with the linguistic weaponry to, to fight the culture wars with which we've become so familiar. They perfected the te technique of taking two words with antithetical meanings and ramming them together to drain them of all positive attributes. Totalitarian democracy is one. Repressive tolerance, the title of a polemic Marcuse wrote in 1965, is another. In this way, the new left jettisoned the old left's promotion of industrialization and the economic interests of the working class. For anyone who is not a Republican uh, operative, it is plain to see that the crisis on the left caused by its abandonment of the interests of working people in favor of saving the planet presents a huge opportunity for right of center politicians. Marcuse and the Frankfurt School have had a great impact on American university life out of all proportion to their number, and I think in leaching out the values of the Enlightenment from American universities. In the words of a historian of the Frankfurt School who's very sympathetic to them, quote, although they wrote and lectured about an intellectual tradition critical of most aspects of US society, scholars of the Frankfurt School were invited into the establishment earning chairs at such prestigious universities as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cornell, Columbia, Duke, the University of California at Berkeley, and the University of Chicago. Other developments around this time reinforced the Frankfurt School's call for a radical rejection of Western industrial civilization and Western values. The sudden emergence of environmentalism as a political movement can be dated with precision. 1962 and publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. In reality, Silent Spring is a work of fiction and all the more powerful for that. Its impact was immense. I would go so far as to say that Silent Spring is the most consequential book of the post-war era. Just 10 years separate its publication from the first major UN conference on the environment in Stockholm in 1972. The nature and purpose of the natural sciences also began to change around this time. It was in the 1960s and the early 1970s that scientists staked a claim to political power when the West experienced its first environmental wave, which had been, was propelled by Silent Spring. 1968 saw the formation of the Union of Concerned Scientists, 98,000 strong nowadays with a $28 million campaigning budget, its website proclaims its mission as being about the health of the planet. In the early 1970s, scientists claimed that economic growth was in conflict with nature and environment. In 1972, 37 eminent experts, including five fellows of the Royal Society and 16 holders of science chairs at British universities, put their names to a document that predicted the termination of industrial civilization within the lifetime of people then living. From the 1960s onwards, the belief that man's, mankind's interventions in nature risk catastrophes of one kind or another led to a recurrence of environmental scares. And I use the word scare advisedly, advisedly because that's exactly what they were. The first sparked by Carson and Silent Spring was the pesticide scare, in particular DDT. It led the Nixon administration to announce the EPA's banning of DDT on the eve of that first UN conference in, in Stockholm. Nixon's DDT ban was pure politics. What else would you have expected? Just like Barack Obama's announcement blocking Keystone XL in the run-up to the Paris Climate Summit two months ago. Indeed, 
Paris 2015 is the direct descendant of Stockholm 1972, being the 21st Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, which had been convened to mark the 20th anniversary of the Stockholm Conference. So there you have a history of the climate change conferences in just one sentence. That, that, that Stockholm Conference stands at the confluence of two vast tributaries. The environmentalism of the North met the development agenda of the South. The pivotal figures in bringing this about was the conference organiser, the Canadian Morris Strong, and the Britain Barbara Ward. Barbara Ward was the most networked person on the planet before the internet. She knew everyone, presidents, prime ministers, popes, and third world leaders. During the 1945 British general election, she escorted a young na American naval officer, John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson said that hers were the only books he read, writing to her two days before he left the White House, whatever mark we made in these last five years clearly bears your stamp too. To avert the threat of a third world boycott of the uh, UN conference, Barbara Ward and Morris Strong, sipping Dom Perignon in his New York apartment, they were very upmarket champagne socialists, devised a political formula to insulate the, th the third world's development aspirations from th first world environmentalism. The essence of what they came up with is that economic growth is double-edged. In the case of rich countries, growth harms the environment. In the case of developing nations, growth improves the environment. After Stockholm, Barbara Ward fleshed out the terms of the alliance between environmentalism and the third world and the third world, which today the world knows as sustainable development. The price of getting third world countries to the table was the promise of massive resource transfers from north to south. This agenda became part of the UN-sponsored New International Economic Order on systems of governance for the so-called global commons. In the 1970s and the 1980s, they were, it, was, it was the oceans, now it's the atmosphere and some form of global taxation to reflect the North's exploitation of the South's resources. Its ideology was deeply hostile to capitalism. The direct declaration of the establishment of the new international econo economic order portrays unregulated businesses as predatory and destructive. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher fought against their dem the, the demands of the, the econ new international economic order in the early 1980s, and for some time, it looked like it had disappeared, but it never really went away. It reappeared in new and green garb in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit. Conference organizer, Morris Strong. The order in New International Economic Order is a clue to something else. It will come as no surprise to you that Ward was a great believer in government planning, indeed planning on a planetary scale. It was imperative for mankind to know where it's going and what the world would look like in 20 years' time, wrote, Ward wrote in a 1966 paper, Spaceship Earth. Quote, it is surely inconceivable that we should turn the whole human experiment over to forces of change which we can neither master nor even fully understand. Thus, massive resource transfers, Hillary Clinton at the 2009 Copenhagen Cl Climate Conference was promising $100 billion a year and if not global government, government, then global governance, have formed part of the core of environmentalism for over four decades. As you can see, environmentalism is a lot more th than the environment. And in some respects, it's not about the environment at all. And here it's time to dispel a common myth about environmentalism, that it is about conserving nature and preserving endangered species. In fact, environmentalist concern about nature is highly partial. It all depends on the cause, not the effect. One reason environmentalists com campaigned against DDT was because it allegedly led to thinner eggshells of eagles and other raptors, putting their survival at risk. We now know this was false. Raptor eggshells have been thinning long before the introduction of DDT. On the other hand, environmentalists don't object when raptors are killed in environmentally friendly ways. Eagles and other birds of prey are attracted to the thermals you get in the hill country. Those same hillsides are now attracted, are now dotted with wind turbines. 
So which should it be, raptors or wind farms? For environmentalists, the mass eco-slaughter of, e uh, of eagles, raptors and migratory birds by the rotating blades of wind turbines is necessary. Wind farms good, coal-fired power stations bad. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, even has a set of holy spurious numbers to justify this wind-powered avian holocaust. As I said, the determining factor is the cause, not the effect. After DDT, next down the pipe was the acid rain scare of the 1970s and 1980s. And in many ways, this is the most interesting, as it, is a, it, as it really was a dry run for global warming. They had the same enemy, coal-fired power stations, and they had the same answer, emissions cuts, sulfur dioxide for one, carbon dioxide for the other. The National Academy of Sciences linked the two. The science of acid rain, it said, was much further developed than global warming. What the NAS doesn't want you to know is how the supposedly subtle science of acid rain subsequently fell apart. Sure, power stations make rain more acidic. Rain is naturally acidic, especially after thunderstorms. But acid rain wasn't the cause of lake acidification. Acid rain wasn't destroying forests. A handful of brave scientists found that changes in land use, not acid rain, had caused the lakes of the Adirondacks to become acidic and lose their game fish. The EPA knew all this full well when it pushed the Clean Air Act amendments through Congress in 1990 and delayed publication of the final report of the 10-year Federal Acid Rain Research Program, which set this all out. Yet 25 years on, if you go to the EPA's website, it falsely states that acid rain is a serious environmental problem affecting large parts of the United States that is particularly damaging to lakes, streams and forests. How to say this politely? What the EPA asserts about acid rain is a downright scientific fraud. Given this, does anyone really think that the EPA is in the business of discovering the truth about global warming? And would it tell us if it found anything that might put a question mark over what has become politically settled science? So it's perhaps worth going back to what climate scientists were saying about global warming before politics settled the science. The first chairman of the IPCC, Bert Berlin, acknowledged that man-made global warming was not something which you can prove. The IPCC's first assessment report produced in 1990 is distinctly equivocal. It noted that a, large, that a global warming of a larger size had almost certainly occurred at least once since the end of the last glaciation without any appreciable increase in greenhouse gases. Quote, because we do not understand the reason for these past warming events, it is not yet possible to attribute a specific proportion of the recent smaller warming to an increase in greenhouse gases. The IPCC went on to note the existence of many significant uncertainties and inadequacies in the observational climate record, in knowledge of the causes of natural climatic variability and computer models. For this reason, the IPCC concluded that, quote, scientists working in this field cannot at this point in time make the definitive statement, yes, we have now seen an enhanced greenhouse effect, unquote. In climate activist parlance, in 1990, the IPCC were climate deniers. So whenever you hear Bill McKibben or Senator Sheldon Whitehouse or the Attorney General of New York or Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton claim that ExxonMobil or whoever somehow hid the truth about global warming, point them to what the IPCC, IPCC was saying in 1990 and then ask, have, have there been any scientific discoveries since 1990 to justify changing that conclusion? Sure, we have had the now discredited hockey stick, which purportedly showed falling te global temperature for 900 years and a sudden increase at the start of the 20th century. We've had satellite data of atmospheric temperature, which the climate clarity prefers to downplay. And we've had 18 years or so of climate model predictions bounding ahead of observations. That should give science, any true scientist pause for thought. A good model is a means of systematically bringing together understanding of a scientific problem to yield predictions and then test that understanding against nature. 
If the predictions are wrong, it follows there's something wrong or incomplete with scientists' understanding. I referred a little earlier to a profound and subtle change in the nature and purpose of science. And here's a key point about it. This is not about advancing scientific knowledge on climate. It's about war. And science is one of the weapons used in that war. Science has been weaponized. The climate wars will decide whether we let the market provide us with the cheapest, most reliable forms of energy to power economic progress. Take away fracking, and the anemic economy of the Obama years would now have barely recovered. Or it will determine whether America will fo follow Europe down its wind and solar policy calamity. Right at the moment that President Obama and the EPA are taking America down the path of energy purgatory, the Europeans are waking up to the enormity of their mistake. Two years ago, the European Commission published a paper on its post-2020 climate and energy tar targets. It gave Europe a get-out-of-jail card. The new renewable and decarbonisation targets would only apply to Europe as a whole. There would be no targets for individual member states. Imagine if the EPA had set a federal target but no state targets. The Clean Power Plan would be dead. Even if the consensus on global warming turns out to be correct, one country cutting their greenhouse gases, gas emissions only makes sense if everyone else does it. Without the prospect of that happening, the rationale goes up in smoke. Thus, the real purpose of the Paris Climate Agreement is to justify the ruinously expensive renewable energy programs beloved by environmentalists. We saw this happening with the Obama administration arguing before the Supreme Court that implementation of the Clean Power Plan was essential to meeting the commitments the US had just made in the Paris Climate Agreement. In its five to four decision on Tuesday, the court froze implementation of the Clean Power Plan pending the outcome of legal challenges. But it's worth recalling, as Ben Shapiro mentioned with his reference to uh, Justice Kennedy, Justice Kennedy is the swing vote, and whatever swings that vote, uh, Ben knows, of the outcome of the entire legal challenge to the Clean Power Plan. I don't like to think what the future of the United States hangs on if that's the case. But something else is going on underneath all this, something that Pre President Eisenhower foresaw over 50 years ago. Speaking at the 2007 Bali Climate Conference, former Vice President Al Gore told climate delegates that they should feel privileged, quote, to be alive at, the moment, at a moment when a relatively small group of people could control the destiny of all generations to come. So we come to the bottom line. Global warming involves the oldest question in politics. Who governs? An open society, philosopher Karl Popper wrote, is one that not merely tolerates dissenting opinion, but respects them. Democracy, that is a form of government devoted to the protection of the open society, cannot flourish if science becomes the exclusive possession of a closed set of specialists. In the 1620s, Francis Bacon, a former Lord Chancellor of England, argue that the Republic should be governed by scientists. A generation after Bacon, John Locke's political philosophy is based on the Socratic insight that to err is human, one that is applicable to science and politics alike. The Constitution of the United States is the fullest and most perfect embodiment of Locke's political philosophy. Here we have popular sovereignty mediated by a constitutional order of checks and balances. It was during the age of global warming that the West came closest to realizing Bacon's vision. The outcome of the climate wars was not decided in Paris in December. It will not be decided in Beijing by the Communist Party of China. The outcome of this war will be decided later this year, on November the 8th, and it will be decided by you. Thank you. Please raise your 
this isn't uh, <clears throat> uh, environmentalism uh, and being isn't a matter of uh, of uh, balance and being sensible about it. In other words, uh, isn't part of the problem going to such a, an extreme? You're not going to say it's a bad thing to improve the air quality in Los Angeles, for example, with emission standards, as opposed to Beijing, where the you know the, the you can't even see the sun or the, the the polluted water and streams. So, I mean, we need some sensible uh, you know controls and and uh, and uh, government efforts. But so isn't it, isn't it basically a matter of, of degree and, and using just some common sense? Sir, I completely agree with you. What you. The two words that stick out of that is sensible and common sense. I'll take, a, I'll take an example of, of another disastrous European policy, which is nearly 50% uh, in some countries of new cars in, in new, some European countries uh, have, have diesel engines. And this was, and this was to increase uh, fuel economy. So more MPG means less carbon dioxide coming out of the car emission, car, car tailpipe. But the consequence of that is you have more nitrogen oxides and you have more uh, particulates. And so the air quality of European cities is now converging. It's, it's, it was declining and it's now, now deteriorating and it's converging with third world cities. So environmentalism or, or the monomania about carbon dioxide and decarbonisation is leading to this perverse outcome of worsening the, the environment. And that's where it, that's where it is. That's why I, I, I mentioned about windmills and uh, wind turbines and, and the effect on bird life. If it really was about preserving nature and, and, and so forth, you wouldn't be doing wind farms, period. Thank you very much. In a society that has a knee-jerk reaction, I'm interested in, in uh, what you would say, if you had your crystal ball, what you think the fallout will be as a result of Flint, Michigan's water crisis? Well, I, I would take, a, I would take a, um, another example of, of environmental mishandling, which is the EPA releasing, was it two or three million tons of, um, of mine wastewater in, in that river in Colorado. And the problem is that when you're saving the planet, you're not doing the things that really matter. You're not looking after the local. Pollution, most pollution is local, and you need to focus on the, on the local, local pollution. It's when, when they get into saving the planet that you lose touch with all that. Thank you for coming out today. If I understood you correctly, uh, you said that uh, there were one or more voices in Europe that are starting to uh, see the light and to speak out in terms of this topic. Other than yourself, are there, is there anyone on the horizon in Europe who has a chance of being heard on the world stage and inject what some of us would call some sanity into this discussion? I think it's slightly, I think the sanity has come, come from reality. You know, reality is the great educator. And the reality is that Europe's uh, renewable uh, energy program has proved disastrous. It's created, you've got very high electricity prices. Uh, Germany and Denmark have, have two of the, uh, the highest uh, electricity prices in the world. It shuts down, it destroys the economics of gas and coal-fired power stations. And so they've got this immense practical problem and they don't know what to do about it. So, but the first reaction of, of, the, uh, of the European Commission will say, well, look, well, hold on, guys. We just, we don't want to keep, keep going on down this route. So if you like, I, you know, I'd love to claim credit for, for, for making the European Commission see sense, but actually that isn't the case. What, is, what has happened is just reality. The reality is so horrible, you can't ignore it anymore. And that will happen here, but you don't want to go there. You don't want to get to the gruesome reality where you have to say, we actually have to back off out of this. You want to look what's happening in Europe and learn from it. And that's the one thing the Obama administration and the EPA do not have a clue about. How can we get your message to the right people in America? Well, first of all, I think one of the, the things, the key, key thing is not to be intimidated by the campaign of delegitimization to get and to, and to speak out. That is first, the first and foremost, because part of what this, 
what the other side, if you like, are doing is trying to silence criticism. So the first thing is to get people talking about it. The second thing is that, as I mentioned right at the outset, the US, United States is the only country where there has been a debate, a political debate about global warming, and Republicans have, have, have uh, disagree, a lot of Republicans have disagreed with Democrats and the global warming consensus. So there's a clear, you know, you have, a de you have much more of a democratic choice than anywhere in the world because in Europe, virtually every political party has signed up to this. Every party with a hope of, uh, of governing. So you have no choice. Here, you have a choice. And that's why I said November 8th is decision time. I have two questions. I'm ready. First of all, is there a way to hold Gina McCarthy up to sufficient ridicule so that she has to resign whether Obama uh, has her back or not? And the second question is, is there anybody out there calling windmills what they are, which is an uglification of our landscape and a killer of 600,000 or however many bird, 600,000 birds per year. The problem with the EPA is that it's a, a completely unaccountable federal agency. And it really, the, the only person Gina McCarthy is accountable to is, is the president. And that's why, that's why I come back to the, to the answer I just gave. It really depends on the outcome of the next election. I completely agree with you on, on if you look at the way what, the EPA, I've, I've got an article on, to, on today's uh, National Review Online about this, but the EPA is, is a lawless agency. It goes, it doesn't just go to the limits of the law, it goes way beyond, uh, way beyond the law. And you've seen this, it's been, it's been involved in, the, in, in covert lobbying, which the General Accounting Office uh, said was uh, violated uh, federal, federal law. So, as I say, this is this is an, this is a, uh, an agency that, that that's out of control, but it's un it's not answerable to anyone other than the president. Um, so, what was the second question, sir? I think with um, what what you see with the what I call the avian holocaust is that a lot of the environmental NGOs are a lot of their funding comes from very large West Coast foundations that are very, very green. Uh, and they are, they are very closely aligned with the, with the renewable um, industry. And that, that is a big problem. On the other hand, there are smaller uh, nature, nature conservation societies which have the, the interests of the birds first and foremost. But I think this, this, is, this is a crisis of environmentalism. Is environmentalism about protecting nature, or is it about a huge political agenda? And I think because the environmentalist NGOs have gone on, on, on the ideological agenda, it is leading to all these problems, and at some point, they will be called out on it. Um, yes, right in the back. <clears throat> yep, about t eight to 10 years ago, the term global warming was uh, somewhat surplanted by the term climate change. And then a second part to the question, um, as far as, um, maybe that, that first part is just fine. First thing. <laughs> I have a, um, I prefer to talk about global warming because that's the title of my book. Uh, there is, there is, it is, it, it's, this is a difficult one because if you look at the uh, nomenclature, there was talk about climate change. The, climate change, we can date it quite. We know that they were talking about climate change in 1988 because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's when it was established. I think partly the why they talked about climate change because, as some of, some of you have been saying to me, recall in the, in the early 70s, the concern then was cooling. So in a way... You can talk about cli climate change kind of wraps up all the threats to the, you know, the temperatures might go lower, they might go higher, call it climate change. So I think, it, I think that's, that's the reason why the IPCC adopted that nomenclature. And if you look at the, when the IPCC was formed, its formation, which happened, the build-up that was through the, through the late 80s and the mid-80s, 
the, the people then would have been aware of that, that actually they'd been, uh, 10 years before, they'd been talking about uh, the threat of global cooling. So you choose a name that covers both outcomes, don't you? About eight years ago, we went to the Heartland Institute uh, conference on global warming. There were 88 PhDs, along with the president of the Czech Republic, who wrote uh, the book uh, Blue Planet and Green Shackles, and he explains the political nature of it. But Dr. Lindzen from MIT, Dr. Soon from, uh, he's with uh, Smithsonian Institute of Climatology, Dr. Art Robinson, I went with an open mind. There were 88 PhDs in the president of the Czech Republic, and they all said that there's no scientific evidence that what we're doing is affecting the CO2 or causing global warming. They spent over $100,000 to try to get any news agency to come there, and the only news agency that would come are these obscure little ones in Europe. Um, but I mean, it, and Dr. Robinson and Dr. Soon, they submitted their research and had 26,000 scientists say that global warming doesn't exist, but nobody ever hears about any of these things. And I just wanted you to comment on that. Yeah, I think this is, this is what I referred to earlier, is the, is the delegitimization of criticism and alternative views. And it's, it's part of, it's, it's a huge, you've got, they've got to take competing explanations off the table. And that's why it's terribly important, as I said earlier, is to keep talking about it. And even though that conference wasn't reported, it will have some impact. Things ripple out. And I can't, it, can't say more, you know, more clearly, it's critical to keep talking about it and, and present alternative points of view. Yes, sir, a, a few moments ago, a gentleman asked about uglification of the wind turbine landscape. And I might point out that there are people who object to the uh, of uglification. Uh, the Kennedys at Hyannisport were adamantly <laughs> opposed to any wind tunnel that could be seen from their front yard. Yeah. I'd Environmentalism is, 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 a, is very interesting because as, uh, when I, at the start of my talk, I said, you know, this is an ideology, you compare it to Marxism. I think the, the thing about environmentalism, as I, I call it, it's ethics for the wealthy. If you, show that, if you show the world, I care about saving the planet, yaggity yak, you gain immunity from, from criticism from the, from the left about having too much money. And that's, I think that accounts for a lot of why, uh, why a lot of wealthy people um, are so ostensible about being green. It's, as I say, ethics for the wealthy. That's terrific. <laughs> What's your position on nuclear power? There's, there's a source that could be cleaner, and I personally think it's been terribly mismanaged by the federal government as well as industry. Nuclear power is, uh, once you've got a nuclear power step, once you've built a nuclear power station, the economics are very, very clear. You want to keep that nuclear power station running for as long as you possibly can, because the costs are upfront in terms of building it, and then the costs, the costs at the end when you decommission it. That's where the costs are, and the running costs in the middle are really, uh, are really quite low. And that's what's very interesting, what, what, what's happened in Germany. Why Germany, which has been the leader in the greening of Europe, you look what's happening in Germany. After Fukushima, uh, Angela Merkel panicked, and she's ordered the rapid close down of the German nuclear industry. If Merkel and the Germans are really concerned about CO2 emissions, you wouldn't do that. You keep those nuclear power stations going on for as long as possible. So what Germany shows is this isn't really about global warming. They say it's about global warming, but if it was really about global warming, you wouldn't shut down a single nuclear power station. Uh, which of the Republican candidates do you think are strongest on this? And what should we be listening for as these primaries proceed? Well, I have to say, as a, as, a, as a foreigner, I wouldn't want to 
suggest which which way you which way you wrote it's sort of kind of but I would I am going to uh, there are some things you can hear with some politicians and you just know they're going to be really bad on this so when when uh, Jeb Bush uh, says I want to I want to create consensus in Washington and there are so many people on the planet we're bound to be having an effect on climate kind of alarm bells ring a little bit you know so anyway <laughs> I came from Iceland, and uh, they have a, about the cleanest environment in the world in Iceland. The electricity is, is produced by geothermal and hydroelectric. The houses are heated uh, geothermally. Yet, uh, we had a little volcano in Iceland last year, seven months, and we were the biggest polluter six of the seven months in the world. Yes. Country of 330,000 people. I want your comments about that. <laughs> well, I think, I, think the, um, I think the country that actually takes, I've already said, I think, I think Germany scores very highly as a, as a climate hypocrite for closing down its nuclear power, power stations. But the other one that's you know, strongly in the running, I wouldn't put Iceland in. I've, sort of, I've been to Iceland once, I really love the country. But I think the, one that, the other one that sticks out is Norway. You know, they're, going zero, they, they're boasting they're going zero carbon. And where's their wealth come from? It comes from under the North Sea with, uh, from, from oil. I mean, you could just can't make that stuff up, can you? <laughs> That's a good question. I think it must have been, um, the, the question is Barbara Ward, when was Barbara Ward uh, put in the House of Lords? And my guess is it would have been a Labour government in the, in the mid 1970s. She died, I think it was in 1981. And so uh, my guess, but uh, I'd have to look that up. She, was, she would have been put in the House of Lords. I mean, she, she's, it's very interesting when she died, um, if you read the Guardian obituary, uh, it didn't make any reference to her, her extraordinary impact on the environmental debate. And the New York Times called her, I think they called her something like a, they described her as a propagandist, but really she was a much more important and pivotal figure than that in, in the creation of the, the, the modern environmental movement. Thank you very much for having the courage to speak out as you do. Scientists that are skeptical, including very famous ones, Richard Lindzen of MIT, Ian Plymer of Australia, even Bjorn Lomborg, who um, agrees with some of the uh, global warming uh, ideas, um, are ostracized and have funding removed and their positions at the research institutions compromised. Have you seen any backlash against your position since you're outspoken? And what would you say to those scientists that are bold enough to speak out despite the fact that their personal positions are often compromised as a result of doing so? What, what you've described is what, what President Eisenhower warned about in that in his in his farewell speech and if you look at what happened with acid rain it's very instructive because the scientist who the lead scientist on the federal uh, uh, program research program uh, was uh, he had the EPA demonize him and they he, they got together a um, some tame scientist to do a phony peer review of his work and said what what the scientist has produced is absolute trash he's worthless he doesn't know anything he's he, he's talking about and it got so bad that this scientist threatened to sue the deputy administrator of the EPA and uh, then the EPA did this he got in a bit of a panic about it and they FedExed a, an apology to this scientist but he got the apology but he didn't get any further research work. So I, I'm afraid, I don't have any good news on that score. I think that the power of politics and the state 
and the climate industrial complex is so strong that it's extremely difficult for scientists. Basically, they are taking a decision to sacrifice their career when they, when they speak out, which is why it's, it's older scientists who have nearing the end of their working lives who are in the position to speak out. But I think that aspect is, that is the price that science has paid for environmentalism and global warming. How about yourself? Have you experienced any backlash on being an outspoken critic? Um, yeah, I've had sort of one, or two, one or two interesting reviews of the book. I mean, I was the Sunday Times guy. Um, review uh, compared me to having the jaws of a hyena. Uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But, you know, that kind of thing I can, I can live with, you know. I'm quite happy to have something like that. We have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Thank you. I've heard that uh, in terms of global warming, that water vapor is the major contributor. And with carbon dioxide representing 400 parts per million of the air, it's actually a minor contributor. And it's actually good for plants if it were to increase. Uh, any truth? Well, it, it's, uh, it's certainly true that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, increases plant growth. It's also the case that the most ubiquitous and strongest uh, greenhouse gas is, as you say, water vapour. And my understanding of the science is that the IPCC's, uh, the consensus um, view or predictions of, of, of warming depend on in more CO2 causing more water vapour. So it's the amplification effect of, of CO2, uh, of CO2 on, on water vapour that the, the, is critical to the values they get for, for, for global warming. But this all has to be proved, and the only proof is in observations, matching your predictions against observations. And every year that passes, the gap between prediction and observation has widened. And that, you know, if, they'd been, if they were true scientists, they'd be asking ourselves, well, actually, we have to revise our, we have to revise, you know, perhaps there isn't so much of an ampli amplification effect. But that is a matter for sci scientists to work out, not to justify their predictions, but to change, to accept that they need to change their understanding of what's going on in the Earth's atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>